And I call on the Minister, Aileen Campbell, to speak to and move the motion. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The closure of our recent consultation to create a diet and obesity strategy for Scotland provides real opportunity for Parliament to unite and consider how we collectively create the healthier Scotland that I know we all seek. The consultation generated significant attention, nearly 400 responses from a range of contributors, from members of the public to academics and health professionals to the food and drinks industry and everything in between. It is clear that this most pressing issue has captured the imagination and we are grateful to everyone who took part and will reflect on the contributions and will publish analysis soon. And of course, presiding officer today gives parliamentarians their chance to add their views and opinions too. It should though come as no surprise that the consultation generated such interest. That interest echoes the growing recognition of Scotland's diet and obesity challenges which require urgent attention. And while of course there will be differing views and opinions as to the approach we should take, what was clear is that the scale of the challenge we face and the need to act decisively was widely recognised. And it is a view shared by the public more generally. Food Standards Scotland reported yesterday that 91% of people think obesity is a serious problem. While this issue is by no means new, what there is, presiding officer, is a new resolve to tackle it, galvanising professions, the public and politicians alike. And just as we have in the past with alcohol and tobacco, we will need to rise to the challenge, taking decisive action to bring about long needed change. This issue won't fit neatly into an electoral cycle, nor, as I think Miles Briggs' amendment makes clear, one ministerial portfolio or one discipline. As a nation over the past 17 years, meeting our dietary goals has remained stubbornly challenging. So too was tackling uh, the associated health inequalities. In its new situation report, Food Standards Scotland reported that two thirds of people living in Scotland continue to be either overweight or obese. 29% of children are still at risk of becoming overweight or obese. Around 32% of adults living in the most deprived areas are obese compared with just 20% in the least deprived areas. And separately, the primary one BMI measurement shows that obesity rates in the most deprived areas are 14 percentage points higher than in the least deprived areas. Poor diet affects all of Scotland, but as so often is regrettably the case, the people who are most impacted by poor health outcomes are those facing most inequalities in life. We are all familiar with these stats, but there doesn't have to be an inevitability about this if we can get it right. We all know that health consequences of obesity are life-changing, sometimes life-threatening. Obesity is the second biggest cause of preventable cancer behind only smoking. Food Standards Scotland's recent report also illustrated stark realities of the common diseases where diet was a contributory factor. 6,697 deaths from coronary heart disease, 2,181 deaths from stroke, 31% of primary one children had obvious dental decay. The cost of obesity and poor health is unsustainable. It is costly to our economy, it is costly to our NHS, but more importantly, it is costly to individuals and their sense of health and well-being. And the biggest frustration of all is that all of this is largely preventable. For these reasons, we require a new strategy for Scotland that benefits everyone, but does have a steely focus on tackling inequalities and also focuses on reversing the trends of childhood obesity to ensure children get their best start in life and their chance to flourish. Our consultation focused on three strategic priorities, transforming the food environment, encouraging and supporting the adoption of healthier and more active lives, and building strong leadership and exemplary practice within both the public sector and food and drink industry. In terms of promotion, we recognise we need to be bold in tackling the overall environment that makes it difficult to make positive dietary choices and instead incentivises taking less healthy options. Because the reality is that so much of modern day life makes it hard to maintain a healthy weight, whether because of the energy density of today's food, our increasingly sedentary lifestyles, or the constant stream of messaging encouraging us to consume more food and drink. And that's why we announced as part of our programme for government that we would be progressing world-leading world measures to limit the marketing of products high in fat, sugar or salt, which disproportionately contributes to ill health and obesity. But other measures on marketing are needed. 
The food environment isn't just shops where we buy food. It is all around us, from adverts on bus stops and billboards to the food outlets in our high street and near our schools. We are all susceptible to advertising, and children, though, are especially impressionable. And that's why we're continuing to urge the UK government to take action to restrict all advertising until after the 9pm watershed, and that if they don't make headway on this, then they should provide us with the powers to do this ourselves. However, in the context of the powers that we have, we need to make sure that we maximise all of their levers to ensure that we can make the impact that I think we all want and expect. Therefore, the places and spaces we live in also need to be conducive to healthy lifestyles. And that is why we will continue to build on the good work being taken forward through the place standard to explore what more we can do in developing healthy, sustainable communities. We will continue to promote innovative ways of keeping active in everyday life, including promoting the Daily Mile, a simple yet really effective uh, way of ensuring people become more active in their daily routines. We'll be increasing the active travel budget to encourage more people to be more active, including when they travel to work or to school. And we'll continue to support initiatives such as Football Fans in Training, which has since 2010 helped change uh, lives and transform lives to ensure much more healthy lifestyles are adopted. But there is much more we can do to support people who are already overweight. And in addition to the funding, we provide health boards for weight management services. We will invest an extra 42 million over the next five years to reduce the rates of type two diabetes. And we'll also continue to have a focus on the early years. Understanding that early intervention is key to instilling healthy habits that last a lifetime. We must be alert to the opportunities that are present, such as the rollout of 1,140 hours of early learning and childcare, and the opportunity that we have there to ensure that those children get their opportunity to understand the importance of health, healthy food ch choices. And we'll also build on the good work that is happening now, illustrated last week through our Scottish Maternal and Infant Nutrition Survey, which found that 43% of mums are continuing to breastfeed up to six months after birth compared to 52% in 2010. There has also been a welcome increase in breastfeeding in the most deprived areas and amongst young mothers, but there are still significant inequalities and we want to make sure everyone has the best start in life, recognizing the importance of early nutrition. So we will be investing more resources into supporting, protecting and promoting breastfeeding as part of our current programme for government commitment. But businesses also have an important role to play and to help them do that, we will support businesses to innovate. The soft drinks industry has taken great strides in advance of the UK's government's soft drinks levy, and that shows what can be done. But we recognise that there will be significant challenges for SMEs Therefore, we'll continue to develop a package of support, investing an initial 200,000 to help them make their products healthier. And we'll also work with industry, the enterprise networks and universities to ensure the considerable existing resources for innovation also support this work. Similarly, the out-of-home sector also has the potential to play a really significant role in driving improvements to the Scottish diet. And Food Under Scotland is developing a strategy that will include cal calorie labelling and portion control. And as part of this, it will consult later this year on this issue. And I would encourage all of our parliamentarians who have an active interest in this to, to promote this uh, consultation and to take part where they can. Presiding officer, I am determined that we do deliver a bold, innovative and effective strategy. One that draws on the evidence that we have to enable more people to have healthier, happy lives and to help relieve pressures on our NHS. There is a growing consensus that there is a serious diet and weight problem that needs to be tackled in a much more concerted way than before. And it is a consensus that includes this parliament that goes much wider beyond it. It's also a journey that we're about to embark on that we have to recognise won't be easy. While there is clear consensus in statistics and uh, the work that Food Standards Scotland has been taking forward, there will be challenges, sensitivity and many questions. And that we need to recognise that this will impact on many people's lives. This is not an issue that impacts upon some people somewhere. It is going to impact on everyone in all our communities. So we need to recognise that there will be challenges and we need to remain alert to them. But we do need then confidence in our ambition and a desire to succeed. And in a country of just 5 million people, we also need to work together. 
I said it would be a challenge and it will be a challenge that I think we will all relish because the goal is ultimately a healthier Scotland. Our innovative plans to limit the marketing of products high in fat, sugar or salt will be an important part of our forthcoming strategy. And I very much welcome the open letter from the four health spokespeople in this parliament putting on record their support for this measure and also their call for us to be bold and ambitious in our strategy. So sincerely, I look forward to hearing the views of all members today, which I shall, of course, reflect on as we develop our new strategy on diet, activity and healthy weight, which we intend to publish in the summer. And sincerely, I really appreciate the consensus that has been built around that and look to continue that consensus as we build a strategy that I hope, ultimately, the whole country can be proud of. Thank you very much. I call on Wells Briggs to open for the Conservative Party. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I welcome today's debate. And I'd also like to thank those organisations which have provided useful briefings for today, including Cancer Research UK, the BMA, Di Diabetes Scotland, WITCH, and Obesity Action Scotland. I believe there is a significant degree of consensus in this chamber in terms of recognition of the extent to the challenges we face as a country and how we can move forward in tackling this public health crisis. And as the uh, Minister has outlined, it is a crisis we are rapidly starting to have to look to deal with. And it's a huge concern to all members that two thirds of all Scots are overweight and that we have one of the worst obesity records in the OECD, with now 29% of adults being classed as obese. Meanwhile, almost 30% of our children are at risk of being overweight, with 14% now at risk of obesity. Most weight and obesity indicators have flatlined, or indeed in relation to uh, mean BMI, worsened in recent years, despite many interventions and initiatives and substantial corresponding investment. So it's clear we need to see and have a real look at how, far more, how more far-reaching, effective and a broader approach can help change this. The negative health and financial impacts of obesity cannot be overstated. Quite simply, Scotland's obesity crisis means too many of our fellow Scots are dying prematurely. And it's a massive driver of the sad reality that life expectancy in Scotland is lower than in other nations of the UK and amongst the lowest, the very lowest, anywhere in Western Europe. As well as leading to hypertension and heart disease, obesity is the single biggest preventable cause of cancer after smoking and is linked, as we've already heard, to 13 types of cancer. Being overweight and obese is the most significant risk factor for developing type 2 diabetes, accounting for 80 to 85% of our overall risk of developing the condition. And as we know, the pre prevalence of diabetes has soared in recent years by 40% in Scotland. Average health care costs for people with a BMI of 40 are at least twice those for people with a BMI of 20. And the annual cost to our NHS of dealing with the unhealthy weight and obesity is now e estimated to be around £600 million. The total economic costs of obesity to the nation once wider economic impacts are taken into account may be as high as £4.6 billion every year. And I want to take this opportunity to commend Cancer Research UK for the excellent work which they have undertaken through their Scale Down Cancer campaign in raising public awareness of how obesity is linked to so many cases and different types of cancer, including breast, bowel, pancreatic and esophageal cancers. It's vital that the public have this information made available and like this that so many people can understand fully the very real health risks of being overweight and obese. Until recently, only a quarter of Scottish adults were, were actually aware that being overweight could cause cancer. So cancer research work in this area has been important and I think timely. Turning to the Scottish Government's consultation, the Government's consultation focused on seven key areas and whilst we cannot give our support to all of the policy proposals contained within it, we're able to give our backing to a number and to plans that we think can make a significant difference to help change behaviours. As such, we support moves to restrict multi-buy promotions on junk food, high in fat, sugar and salt, as a course of number of supermarkets have already undertaken to do so themselves. Food Standards Scotland has identified that almost 40% of all calories, 40% of total sugar and 42% of fats and saturated fats were purchased on price promotions in 2014-15. Consumer spending on price promotions in the UK is now the highest in Europe and 50% of high fat foods, sugar, high fat, sugar and salt are purchased in this way. The potential reach and impact therefore of restriction, uh, restricting such promotions is clear and we support. And as the Minister mentioned, polling commissioned by Cancer Research UK demonstrated that 9 in 10 parents believe supermarket promotions impacted on what they buy. It also indicated broad public support for restrictions, with two-thirds of Scots supporting this proposal 
and three in four people wanting to see the balance of promotions shifted towards healthier items. Recent polling by which also suggests a substantial majority of the public want to see more supermarket promotions that offer apply to healthier food choices. And there's clearly market opportunities for supermarkets and retailers to move towards this. As well as restrictions on drunk, junk food multi-buys and a part of a vision where the consumer can have access to the most relevant and useful information about their food in order to be able to make the best informed choices. We also support moves to explore how labelling can be strengthened and improved in this area. The Scottish Government must of course also work with the business community and ensure their concerns and needs are addressed in any changes towards labelling processes and how these are implemented. And I also hope that retailers will step up to the mark and help the country to address and tackle this public health issue. We know that retailers have spent significant sums of money on consumer behaviour in the past, mapping in stores, and so I hope they can actually step up and look towards how we can provide a healthier retail environment in the future. And it's the future health of their customers, after all, which will benefit from that. Well, the consultation have a number, has a number of individual policies which we can support and which, were import, which are important and welcome. We believe that tackling obesity will also involve wider societal and cultural changes which are needed to reduce the overconsumption of unhealthy foods. We also believe that a cross-portfolio, as my amendment points towards, is vital. Our amendment for today's debate makes clear so that the health departments and ministers will be working hand-in-hand hand on this, and I, I welcome what the minister had to say on that, as we look to embed preventative and measures into cross-portfolio work and cross-policy areas. The Parliament's Health and Sport Committee is often frustrated that many of the policy interventions we hear health experts advocating are the responsibility of the education and planning ministers and sit out with our remit and other, health commi and other committees' remits. So I really do hope we will see a cross-parliament and cross-government action on this issue. And this cross-portfolio approach must also include the Scottish Government working constructively with local government and with all those third sector organisations that have a stake here and an important role in our communities. When debating obesity, we also cannot ever afford to forget that we need to focus on promoting healthier, active lifestyles and exercise. And my colleague Brian Whittle will have a lot more to say on that as he closes the debate for us this afternoon. Clearly, we need to look at how calories are burned off by an individual as well as calorie intake and look to ensure that everyone has the access to the physical activities of their choice and within their local community. We are a sporting nation and from the fantastic high level sporting success we witnessed at Murrayfield at the weekend, the question we need to ask ourselves is how do we inspire Scots to undertake more physical activity in whatever form that may actually take. And I think for most people in Scotland and indeed even maybe many uh, MSPs in this chamber, they will have woken up with a bit of a sore head on Sunday. Um, for many, they may have even woken up with last night's kebab, <laughs> who knows, but how we develop, how we, how we develop a national interest in sports from observational, uh, speaking for other members actually, how we, how we develop a, this from a national observatory role into something we all look to be active is something I think we really need to look at and I hope will be developed within the strategy. How we plan our communities and community spaces has a very important role in helping to actually achieve that. Many community sports clubs, as the minister outlined, has already un are already undertaking very constructive community initiatives to open up facilities to their supporters and local communities. And I'd very much like to pay tribute to them, especially those in my own Lothian region. Region. But there's still much more we need to do to be uh, able to achieve this. On my way to work today to the Parliament, I noticed a new exercise bike which has been located by the Council in Royal Terrace Gardens. I've noticed this a few times. I've never seen anyone actually using it and where that's mapped in terms of people being able just to go and do 15, 20 minutes bit exercise is an opportunity. On a recent visit to Aviemore Sports Hub, the Health and Sport Committee of this Parliament were told about how the hub had developed 15 minutes staggering timetabling to allow parents and grandparents to drop off their children and grandchildren in, in activity classes before them being able to then go on to classes themselves. This sort of joined up approach is something we need to develop across uh, government and across um, our sports facilities. My Lothian colleague, uh, Alison Johnson, has highlighted a number of occasions the fact that our, so many people do not jump from low levels of activity to exercise classes and find that a real challenge. And when Mr. we were in Aberdeen, you need to bring your remarks to a conclusion. If you can. Sure. When we were in Aberdeen, we heard more more on this. Um, in terms of um, our amendment, I very much support what the Scottish Government is putting forward today. We hope that we will work constructively as a, as a Parliament and government to take forward this cross-portfolio approach. 
I support the government's motion and I move amendment in my name and hope it will be supported across the chamber. Thank you very much. And apologies to everybody for shortening the time today. David Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. I move the amendment in my name and Labour will be supporting the government motion and the Conservative amendment. Uh, I welcome this debate today. Obesity is a modern day public health crisis. But it's one presiding officer that would be unrecognisable to Scots who lived through rationing in the Second World War, or a century before that, when church parishes had to set up poor houses from Shetland to Selkirk to look after the hungry and the dispossessed. And I share the view of Martin Cohen of the University of Herefordshire, who stated, and I quote, obesity is not just a matter for the nutritionist, rather it's a product of social inequality and requires a collective social response. And as we've heard, obesity has been on the rise for decades. Changes to our lifestyle have had an inescapable repercussions for our diets. The increasing fast pace of life has meant we are more likely to buy quick and easy meals, frequently trading nutritious food for efficiency. And we're also more prone to eat on the go, grabbing a meal deal from the supermarket or even maybe and getting a takeaway for dinner. So this shift in our eating habits inevitably means we are taking in more sugar, salt and fat than we need. And to compound the problem, as the Minister has said, the busyness of life means that fewer and fewer of us are actually active enough to burn off the calories. In 2016, only 64% of those over 16 are estimated to have reached their recommended amount of physical activity each week. The result is a country which is one of the worst records in the OECD. So the consequences of this endemic obesity are severe. The issue is less of a ticking time bomb and more of a grenade with its pin already pulled. For individuals, being overweight comes with numerous increased chronic health risks and reduces life expectancy by at least an average of three, three years. And as Miles, uh, Miles Briggs has said, I commend the work of the Cancer Research UK and Obesity Action Scotland, who are working extremely hard to raise awareness, both here and with the public, of the link between being overweight and developing various cancers. And, President Officer, as the Parliament's former diabetes champion, I'm also encouraged by the government's focus in their consultation document on Scotland's growing type 2 diabetes epidemic. Being classed as obese overweight is a significant contributing factor to developing type 2. And with our obesity crisis, it's unfortunately no surprise that figures of the condition make for bleak reading. Over 257,000 people in Scotland are diagnosed with type 2, and a further 500,000 are at risk of developing the disease. With a diagnosis of type 2 can come serious complications, including the risk of blindness and amputation, beside the clear and grave implication on individuals' quality of life. This growing condition is just one example of the strain that obesity places on our National Health Service resources. Almost £1 billion is spent on the NHS on tackling diabetes, but about 80% of this goes in managing affordable and avoidable complications. So the government's proposal to invest in weight management programmes with long-term goals is thus welcome. Now, Diabetes Scotland have raised concerns to me that budget cuts to teams currently collecting clinical data could significantly undermine assessment of the programme. I therefore urge the government to seriously consider how they will support these existing resources. Talk of precise targets and desired outcomes is only useful if evaluation is possible. Now, when faced with the complexity of our obesity problem, it's easy to feel overwhelmed. Now, some presiding officer may longingly hark back to the good old days when, and Stuart Stevenson, I'm sure, could relate to that, when our, when our food was less processed and children played outside rather than sitting indoors playing football manager. But nostalgia is not the solution. The government's consultation proposals recognise that to be successful, any strategy needs to help people make better choices by changing the environment within which we operate. Now, it's good to see the government seriously considering how advertising and promotion of food high in fat, sugar and salt can be restricted. Key to such an approach will be not just to negatively restrict unhealthy foods, but to make the option of balanced diet more practical. Furthermore, the growth of out-of-home eating means that any strategy needs to have a consistently strong approach when it comes to labelling and marketing of foods by restaurants and takeaways. However, the environmental shift needs to encompass more than just our food culture. 
Although the nature of this public health challenge may look modern, under the surface, the root causes are the same old story. Poverty, social deprivation and inequality are significant contributors to being overweight and it's, least, uh, and it's the least well off who are most at risk. For example, a quarter of all children living in our most deprived areas are at risk of obesity compared to only 17% in the least deprived areas. Uh, the problem was captured in the Health and Sport Committee report in 2015 when it stated, and I quote, a boy born today in Lensley, East and Bartonshire, can expect to live till 82. Yet, but for a boy, a boy born only eight miles away in Calton in the east end of Glasgow, life expectancy may be as low as 54 years, a difference of 28 years, or almost half as long again as his whole life. So, our health inequalities are in fact just inequalities. They cannot be explained away purely as food choices that individuals make. As food prices have risen, it's become harder for families on a tight budget to buy meals that are both filling and nutritious. And evidence shows that consumers want to buy healthier food but think it's more expensive. So regulation of product promotions needs to be more ambitious than merely reducing the number of unhealthy foods on offer. Should also seek to make healthy products more affordable, but placing restrictions in the formulation, sale and advertising of food products is beneficial, but it's also complex and tricky. Controlling the number of food outlets near schools might be something that the Minister might want to respond to, and particularly the local authority uh, licensing of mobile traders. And also the planning system should consider um, how uh, community spaces can encourage physical activity by being welcoming um, and safe. So overall, the government proposals for a fresh approach to tackling obesity um, are positive. The hope is that these proposals are now turned into a strong, practical strategy that has clear targets and systems of evaluation. The key to tackling obesity is seen it's not just a problem for individuals and families, but a wider social problem, similar to educational underachievement or criminality. Poverty, not individual choices, is the driver of the problem. That's only fundamental societal change that fights inequality will cut the Gordian knot of widespread overindulgence. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Stewart. We move now to the open debate. Speeches of five minutes, please. Five minutes this afternoon. Sandra White, to be followed by Annie Wells. Sandra White. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, Presiding Officer, I don't mean to be too harsh, but I think we, we have to, uh, or sensational, but I, I really think we have to tell the truth of what's actually happening at this moment in time. And we really need to educate people uh, that being overweight can literally kill you. I'm not being, you know, I, I think it's got to be said, being overweight can literally kill you. It can lead to high blood pressure. It can lead to strokes. It has already been mentioned by Dave Stewart and regarding type two diabetes and all the complication that brings with it, which Dave Stewart has already mentioned. And also know that other colleagues will mention that too. But I think we've got to be quite harsh and educate people to realize that being overweight has all these other implications to future health. Not just we start with the younger people, but obviously, people of my age and others as well. It's not too late to change your diet and, and be healthier as well. So I really welcome this debate and listen to the contributions as, as well, presiding officer. Now, when you look at the recent study from the Scottish Health Survey, uh, two thirds of Scots are now obese, uh, overweight. Only a fifth of adults eat enough fresh fruit and vegetables. I'm probably one of them, unfortunately, as well, so I'll take a, a lesson from that. Uh, and meanwhile, recommended levels of physical activity needed to prevent health risks in later life are only being met by 31% of men and 24% of women. Quite startling facts. Now, the Health Committee, which I've only just uh, became a member of, uh, produced a paper, and they said that Scotland had a policy framework which could enable the Scottish Government to make decisions, and this is in italics, that may initially be unpopular uh, when introducing such as new initiatives. Well, I'm glad that the Scottish Government decided they may be unpopular because it's something we do absolutely need to bring forward and others have mentioned as well, the Minister too, and I'm very pleased that they've took on board the restriction discounts on junk food, uh, minimal alcohol pricing, even restricting car use, making it more active travel, and obviously the fats and salts intakes in, uh, in, in foods as well. If it's been unpopular, which brings us a Scotland which is healthy and the lives of our children are much improved, well, I'm quite happy 
to be more unpopular than probably sometimes I am already in the, in, in the constituency and certainly support everything that's in the, the Scottish Government's strategy. Now, there's various strategies going on throughout the country, but I want to kind of concentrate on hopefully on some of the issues in my particular area, and this is Greater Glasgow Health Board, already been mentioned by the Minister, live active exercise referral schemes. You can go to your GP, your health visitor, you can ask to be referred, and you can be put forward through a programme of live active confidence building. It gives a more positive lifestyle changes as well. And it's a one-to-one -one catch up with individuals and you get shown through the activities that your life can actually be much better as well. That's one of the things. And also we have the free and access. Glasgow Kelvin can, participants can actually go along to, in my constituency, North Woodside Hall or Kelvin Hall as well. So there's two or three different things too. And the weight management is also in action with the, the local initiative, as I've already mentioned too. It's linked with the live action scheme. Uh, various other areas in, in my constituency, Woodlands Community Development Trust, a fantastic initiative supporting Woodlands uh, within the Kelvin constituents or without. And I want to make this point that it's really important when you live in an area such as Glasgow City Centre or the West End or Partick or whatever, when it's all tenemental property, you really need access to green spaces. Very lucky in Glasgow we've got the parks. But when you're in a tenement building, it's very difficult to have community gardens. And I want to come on to Woodlands Community Garden, which is a fantastic initiative. Uh, the projects, it's, it's got 50 raised beds, local people can grow their own food, they cook with their own food. It's an absolutely fantastic initiative. And perhaps we should be looking at more allotments or monies for allotments as well. And I'll throw that open to the minister as well. And the garden itself is a fantastic therapeutic space. School kids go, nursery kids as well. The community cafe there as well. First minister visited the community cafe a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this is open to everyone. And the real strength is that everyone joins in. There's no distinction between the two. Uh, refugees come along and get fed there as well. So it's an absolutely fantastic initiative. They take the food that they grow in the community gardens and they teach the folk to cook that can't cook. And there's no difference between them. And I know I'm getting looked at and I certainly will finish off in this particular minute as well. Presiding officer, I know I've got five minutes. What I'm just saying is, uh, you know, if we're going to be unpopular, we've got to be unpopular to make sure that we embrace a healthier lifestyle. But there's other things on the ground going on that we can put in as well. Thank you very much, President Officer. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for betraying what I'm doing here with my looks. Uh, Annie Wells, to be followed by Kenny Gibson. Miss Wells, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Scotland's obesity epidemic has become something we can no longer ignore. From an individual perspective, many of us worry about our weight on a daily basis, with two thirds of Scott concerned about their weight or the weight of someone in their family. Whether we're made to feel ashamed of our bodies by images in the media or confused by the ever-changing guidelines on what we should and shouldn't be doing to maintain a healthy weight, it's clear that as a country, we've become lost along the way. Two thirds of adults aged 16 and over in Scotland are overweight, and almost a third of children are at risk of being overweight. We know the repercussions are great, both in terms of health and the cost to the NHS and setting an ambitious national strategy is therefore vital and one that embeds a focus on health eating and physical activity across all government portfolios. This is why the Scottish Conservatives support the Scottish Government on this issue, in particular in relation to the following areas. With the estimated that 110 tonnes of sugar are purchased on price promotion every day in Scotland, the equivalent of 4.3 million chocolate bars, and that 50% of high fat, sugar and salt products are bought this way, it is right the strategy looks to restrict price promotions. And looking beyond the food we consume at home and the fact that eating out can contribute up to 25% of calorie intake, we also support the improvements to labelling. We also support the exploration of how changes to planning could have a positive impact on our food choices and supporting, a small, supporting small businesses and adapting new uh, healthy food manufacturing opportunities as they become more apparent. The biggest challenge I believe is creating long-term cultural change, addressing our relationship with food and encouraging people to make active healthy decisions. This should not always be because the choices have been limited, but because we understand and appreciate the value of healthy eating from an early age. And key to this, as Miles has touched upon, is education 
and a cross-portfolio approach that embeds this ethos into our everyday thinking. To supplement this, of course, is improving physical activity rates from an early age, something our Healthy Lifestyle paper detailed last year. At present, 24% of children are not meeting the current to moderate vigorous physical activity guidelines, a statistic that increases to 36% amongst adults. And not only is physical activity one of the best things we can do to improve our physical health, it's proven to improve our mental well-being, mood and self-esteem, surely all conducive to making healthy eating choices. Linking to this idea is something I really believe we are not talking about enough when it comes to maintaining a healthy weight, and that is taking into consideration the psychological factors linked to our eating habits. It's really easy amongst statistics and strategies to forget that bad food choices are often made knowingly. Many of us are desperately want to lose weight, and we know roughly how to do it, but it's a real struggle. In some serious cases, as leading expert Dr David Blaine recently pointed out in the newspaper, there is quite a large number of adults where there are large psychological components to obesity. Often there are situations of adversity in childhood or other stresses that someone has been under, which has led to overeating as a coping mechanism. And furthermore, as I alluded to in my introduction, many of us are crumbling under the pressure of society, which bombards us with images of the perfect body, distorting our perception of healthy, and making it difficult to motivate ourselves to achieve long-term sustainable lifestyle changes. And I'd like to ask the Scottish Government how it see seeks to widen the focus of the strategy to take into account the psychological factors influencing our eating habits. And the final point I'd like to make today is the need to focus on how socioeconomic factors affect weight and how awareness of this is embedded into the strategy. Adults from deprived areas are more likely to be overweight, obese or obese, and children in the most deprived areas are 8% more likely to be overweight or obese than those from the least deprived areas. I would like to ask the Minister for further detail on how the strategy will prioritise work with families in poverty and in low incomes to ensure that we do not have these disparities. And to finish today, I would like to repeat my support for a national strategy that looks to address one of the greatest health challenges facing Scotland at the moment. And only by working together and embedding healthy eating and physical activity into our nation's ethos, can we achieve the long-term cultural change required to make Scotland a healthy weight nation? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can I remind members to use full names in the chamber? It's easily forgotten, but please do so. I call Kenneth Gibson to follow Joanne Lamont. Thank you, presiding officer. Paradoxically, while well, quality food and produce is something for which Scotland is renowned worldwide, obesity is now one of the major causes of ill health here in Scotland. Our diets can often leave much to be desired, earning us the unenviable position as one of the heaviest nations in Europe. People of a healthy weight are now in the minority, only 35% of Scottish adults, and sadly, I am not one of them. There is no quick fix, no single piece of legislation to change this. Instead, significant effort is now required on all sides from policy change to a shift in societal behaviour in order to ensure a healthier future for Scotland. Of course, for millennia, most people in most countries around the world struggled to have enough to eat. And indeed, a century ago or more, corpulence was seen as a sign of health and wealth. And now the opposite is true. Rises in obesity have largely been driven by the increased availability of affordable and accessible food and drink, high in salt, saturated fats and sugar, combined with an increasingly sedentary and time-stressed lifestyle. Therefore, in addition to individual effort, cultural and environmental changes which determine what people buy and what people eat are needed to help deter ex excess weight gain, support our individuals to maintain a healthy weight and encourage people of all ages to exercise more, even if just by walking while promoting active travel. Obesity can reduce average lifespans by a decade or more and have serious and debilitating consequences on physical and mental health, such as cancer, type 2 diabetes, strokes and depression. It also results in an astonishing economic burden, costing NHS Scotland 600 million a year, significantly reducing productivity in the Scottish economy. Obesity is now one of the biggest public health challenges we face as a nation, very significant, yet preventable impacts on every aspect of society. To successfully tackle this, we must be fully aware of the risks that come with being overweight and obese, and be prepared to combat these risks with tough action and a commitment to change. 
Some measures are already in place, and the Scottish Government has invested £12 million over the last five years on programmes to support and encourage healthy eating, with campaigns such as supporting healthy choices and eat better, feel better. The next step towards a healthier Scotland is the new Scottish Government diet and obesity strategy, a healthier future, action and ambitions on diet, activity and healthy weight, which includes bold measures designed to deliver a new approach to diet and healthy weight management, empower change and help people make healthier choices. The programme for government aims to provide more weight loss support for the 300,000 people in Scotland with type 2 diabetes, a figure that doubled in just two decades. And I commend David Stewart, MSP, for all the hard work he's done in this area over a number of years. And progress measures uh, limiting the marketing of products high in fat, sugar and salt. In 2016, food and drink uh, bought on price promotion represented 36% of all calories purchased in Scotland. In fact, UK consumer spending on price promotions is the highest in Europe. Decisions made by consumers are often made automatically. I'm sure the majority of us have fallen victim and returned from a shopping trip with unhealthy foods we'd not intended to buy, simply because they were on offer. This, the strategy represents a unique opportunity to reduce the wide-reaching influence price promotions have on consumer behaviour. By welcoming the views of a wide range of stakeholders on current proposals, priorities and implementation methods, this ambitious strategy seeks to revolutionise the food environment in Scotland. I've heard many of these first-hand while co-convening with Brian Whittle last week's Scottish Policy Conference keynote seminar, Policy Priorities for Tackling Obesity in Scotland at the Royal Society of Edinburgh, uh, which we chaired in our capacity as co-conveners of the CPG on improving Scotland's health and beyond. And indeed, David Stewart is the other co-convener of, co of that group. I look forward to seeing many of the ideas uh, from that seminar being taken forward. Development of, this, uh, of the much needed strategy is testament to the fact that we are reassessing diet by utilising knowledge gained from tackling other public health challenges such as alcohol misuse and smoking and utilising the growing body of evidence on actions necessary to improve the health of the whole population. I'm certain the measures taken forward will ease the process of making healthier choices on a daily basis by empowering change on, at both a national and personal level. Presiding officer, while developing this new strategy, it is also important to continue promoting community health projects which support people across Scotland in making healthy, affordable choices, as well as promoting the vital role of an active lifestyle. This support, such as that provided by community food networks, helps deliver dignified services to individuals and communities through activities designed around cooking, growing and food education. The programme for government outlined our ambition to make Scotland the best place in the world to grow up, be cared for and be healthy. Therefore, by committing to the delivery of the new strategy over the next five years and offering advice and support to parents, we will get closer to ensuring a healthier future Scotland so desperately needs. After all, an obese child is around five times more likely to become an obese adult, and we cannot afford to let obese to become the new normal in Scotland, regardless of location or circumstances. I'm sure this progressive plan will be exactly what we as a society need to kickstart a positive change in both attitude and positive action towards diet, weight and healthy living. Thank you very much. I call Joanne Lamont, followed by Ash Denham, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I am uh, uh, welcome the opportunity to contribute to this debate, although I have to confess a little unease about the whole debate around obesity and weight, not just because I'm obliged to think through it in order to make a contribution, but I think there is a broader question here. I cannot be the only person who's alive to the fact that alongside this debate on healthy weight today, there is a members debate, I think, tomorrow on eating disorders. And so many of those eating disorders have developed out of body shaming, cruel comments about somebody's size. We know, you know, I um, taught Lena Zavroner, I was in the school when Lena Zavroni attended and she lost her life to an eating disorder. And I suppose it's been something that's patterned um, as I have got older and more of an awareness around eating disorder, and I think we have to be very careful about the language that we use when we are talking about healthy eating and weight and understanding fully the consequences for all too many, particularly for young people, of um, the language around this question. And there's a lot of people, and you know, I am certainly one of them, for whom the whole question of weight is personal. And I, like many women in particular, and there would be a whole debate, I think, about why in particular women worry about their weight. But it is something that has been part of our lives in a very personal way. And we do know, I know uh, from own childhood, and I think as a teacher, the way in which weight became a vehicle for bullying, deeply ingrained in the classroom, and a, a way in which we have to again understand the impact of that 
when we are talking about these questions. Now, so I don't in any way pretend that I'm an expert. I can perhaps have been as many diets as others. But I do want to make a number of observations about what I think is an important debate. I understand the public health impact um, of this question, the importance of understanding at that level the need to tackle the question of obesity. There are good health messages that we need to get out across our populations on healthy eating, on being active, on exercise and on sport. And it's important that we take the time to make sure that people are aware that these messages are for them and not just for other people. But I also think it's important that we move beyond what I would see as a one-dimensional debate, a worthy debate, decontextualised, taken out of government policy, policy choices around spending and health and education and elsewhere. It's important that we mainstream this debate into the general question of the well-being of our communities and understanding actually what is happening there. And some of it is about choice. And we have to understand what shapes those choices. The people are not simply um, somehow malleable by the supermarkets or whatever. And so how we, we combat against that. I also think we need to look and understand there have been many important health initiatives over many years which are now being rolled back. In the early years of this parliament, there was important measures put in at a local community level to encourage healthy eating, to understand about cooking, to understanding about sport, work that was done in after school in our most deprived community. Much of that has gone because of financial constraints of the last period, and we have to recognise that, that these things go hand in hand. And it's also not always easy to take on board many of the sports messages. I've never regarded myself as somebody as a sporty person, but Brian Whittle was off winning um, gold medals. Some of us simply watched but in the 80s in particular, the development of the fun run movement, people like me put on running shoes and ended up running marathons because it was something that was seen as all of us could possibly do. It was easy, it was affordable, and it was supported within our local communities by local authorities and others. And we should learn from that too. But I also think it's important that we understand we need to see the dimension of inequality and disadvantage and health inequalities. Why are women in deprived communities more likely to be obese than men in deprived communities? Why are people in deprived communities more likely to be as obese? You know, as a school teacher, I used to help run attendance groups and we worked with those who were, had a problem coming to school. And we realised that the only thing they often had in common with each other was that they didn't come to school. I believe that is also true of obesity. Not everyone who is obese is obese for the same reasons, and therefore the same solutions will not necessarily address their problems. We need to think about how young people access sport. Does it need facilitating parents or other ways in which community initiatives can support talented young people to access sport without relying on the parent with the car. That too often is a division that develops very early doors within our communities. So my last comment on this, I think we need to go gently. We need to understand the importance of these issues, but we can't back away from the importance of resources. And I would make a particular plea to the Minister to ensure that local government is allowed well, to support I, these issues as well as the other things for which they have responsibility. I've been quite tolerant, but I can't let people overrun by 20 seconds, so it takes from other people. There's no time in hand. Uh, Ash Denham to follow by Alison Johnson, please. Presiding officer, the food environment that we live in today is very challenging. Um, we apparently need to make up to 200 food decisions every day. And summarised, I think, sometimes in that moment that I have, when you look at an orange, and you just think peeling it is just a bit too much effort, which obviously is wrong. And even something as simple as buying a coffee can be fraught with risk because after all, you know you're going to have to spend five minutes queuing up looking at the cake display. 200 decisions, 200 decisions can test even those with the strongest of willpower. Now, I may have come a long way from my typical diet that I used to have as a 14-year-old where lunch was usually a portion of chips and then I'd leave school, go to the local shop and buy some sweets to go with it. And I think most people know that chips and sweets for lunch, it isn't a great choice. And they, need, they know that they need to eat more fruit, more vegetables, and get some exercise. The problem is, that although we often know what to do, we don't seem able to do it. So the strategy is timely in helping people to achieve that. And clearly, the food environment is hugely important. And it's possibly one of the missing links in converting that knowledge into action. 
because if you're having junk food pushed at you constantly, um, it's going to make it very difficult to resist it. So extending the restrictions on junk food advertising for children, therefore, is very important and very welcome. And I know from my own experience with things like multibuys, if you don't buy it from the supermarket and it isn't in your kitchen cupboards, I'm rarely, if ever, going to go out to the shop to buy it later. So the strategy also commits to 200 million for SMEs to reformulate their products in order to make them healthier, which I think is very welcome. But I would just raise a note of concern about that, which can be seen in the case at the moment of fizzy drinks. So to avoid the sugar tax, manufacturers have reformulated, but they've replaced the sugar in those products with artificial sweeteners. And I am quite concerned about the long-term um, damage that these may turn out to have, especially for children. Um, we also need to be able to easily understand what we're eating. That if something is marketed as being healthy, that it actually is healthy. And this is perhaps the other piece of the jigsaw, that food labeling is key here. It has to be easy for people to judge what the nutritional content of the product is, and also that we are carefully regulating the additives and ingredients that go into our food. Uh, are we holding the food industry accountable for the products that they are producing? And some of it we know is deliberately designed to be as addictive as drugs. Should we force the industry to become more accountable and properly label their food so people know what they really are eating? I think we should. Um, I heard one scientist describe our food environment in many cases as not food, they said, but actually it was a food-like substance um, that our bodies don't actually recognize. And that really stayed with me. So these products aren't just making us fat, they're also making us sick too. And um, I'll just illustrate why that's important using the example of bread, something you'd think was quite simple. Um, but similar to other food products, it's a complicated tale now of processing, maximizing shelf life, reducing costs and ingredients that probably shouldn't be there. In 1961, the British Bread Baking Research Association in Chorley Wood devised a fast bread making method using lower protein wheat and an assortment of different additives and high speed mixing. And until the 1990s, if you're eating commercial bread, you were also ingesting potassium bromate, which was then found to be potentially carcinogenic, banned in the EU in 94. It was then replaced by enzymes, which are what make bread huge, soft, squishy, and cheap. And these enzymes, which modern baking relies on, are designated as processing aids, and as such, they don't have to be listed as an ingredient. And it's a protein that speeds up the metabolic reaction. It can be derived from either bacterial, fungal, animal, or plant sources. And many of them are derived from substances that are not part of the normal human diet. And they're known for um, causing occupational asthma in bakers. Currently, these processing aids, either as ingredients or additives, um, bread ma manufacturers are able to sort of disguise them legally, quite legally, their presence from the buying public. But I think the public do deserve to know what is in the products that they're eating, especially when they might be a risk to their health. There is a cost to public health of these type of products. And for example, the recent rise in celiac disease, and there may be a link there between the two. So this strategy is a very strong package of measures, and I'm very pleased to support it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll not look at toast the same again. Uh, Alison Johnson to be followed by Alec Cole Hamilton, please. Um, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I, I'm going to pick up on the points Ash Denham is making. As someone who is just about to finish Sugar Free February, um, the, the Cancer Research Initiative, I have been, it, it really encourages you to look at hidden sugars. It's not the obvious things. And I have a packet of, a picture of a packet, a, a loaf of bread on my phone, which contains caramelized sugar. Um, I'm not going to name uh, the, the, the offending seller, but, but there we are. This is a challenging area. Now, the government's asking for cross-party support um, for action to tackle obesity, and I'm really happy to support that. As the Greens ho uh, health spokesperson, I signed up to the joint letter from all opposition parties to the Cabinet Secretary earlier this month and have previously written to the Minister on the need to regulate price promotions. Our, the Green 2016 manifesto supported policies to make supermarkets healthier places to shop with action on those price promotions on advertising and product placement. It also suggested help for local authorities to create safe and exciting outdoor spaces, more green spaces, more walking and cycling routes, and affordable and accessible sports centres. Um, I know the Minister attended the National Cross Country Championships at the weekend, where she will have seen thousands of people of all ages taking part in an activity that is probably about as affordable as it comes and can be, you know, enjoyed in many locations. 
Um, but she too will be aware, because I believe she too has met Hutchison Vale Football Club recently, um, of the challenge that some of our young people have in accessing the places that they need to train for specific sports, whether that's football, athletics, or training. Um, so this is a, a multifaceted area, and I support the motions from Miles Briggs and David Stewart in that regard. So when we're seeking this big change, there's obviously always going to be those whose interests are challenged. We shouldn't just ignore their concerns, but we should ask why ASDA might oppose restrictions on price promotions in ASDA. Um, often the protests of food manufacturers or big retailers are framed as a valiant defence of consumers, which is why it was really helpful that consumer group which sent a briefing ahead of this debate with the results of consumer research recently conducted in Scotland. Only about 30% of people thought food manufacturers and supermarkets were doing enough to help encourage people to eat better. Cheaper, healthy food is what consumers really wanted. And just over a month ago, I hosted an event with the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health on their State of Child Health Scorecard for Scotland. And their report notes that child health in Scotland ranks among the worst in Western Europe. And it highlighted the really strong relationship between deprivation and weight, a relationship that other colleagues have, have touched on in this debate. For children in Scotland, overweight and obesity prevalence in the most deprived areas was 25%, whereas prevalence for those living in the least deprived areas was eight percentage points lower, 17%. As Kenny Gibson noted, um, this pattern is in complete contrast to the early 1970s where obesity prevalence was the other way around. It was greater in children from the most affluent areas in the most deprived. So this relatively new pattern needs new actions. The government strategy talks about a broad range of actions to address a complex pattern that is true and welcome. Good health means tackling income inequality, discrimination, prejudice. It's not only about more nurses and hospitals. The consultation also recognises that interventions need to rely less on individual choice and more on changes to the wider environment. Everyone wants to eat food that's tasty and nutritious. Let's make that the affordable and easy choice. A spokesperson from Coca-Cola was recently in the news claiming that restrictions on price promotions have little evidence to support their efficacy. Well, in 2015, the Public Health England study on evidence for action on sugar reduction identified price promotions as having the most robust evidence base of all actions. We know that food retail price promotions are more widespread in Britain than in anywhere else in Europe. Foods on promotion account for around 40% of all expenditure on food and drinks consumed at home. Higher sugar products are promoted more than other foods and price promotions increase the amount of food and drink people buy by around one fifth. So they clearly work. These are purchases that people wouldn't make without the in-store promotions. And Annie Wells was quite right too. We have to do another difficult thing, which is to consider the emotional and psychological dimension food has. Can we develop a more psychologically informed approach to weight management? This means working with people to address damaging patterns without stigmatizing their weight, a point well made by Joanne Lamont. Because we know that stigmatizing behaviors and conditions only damages people's health. It makes them more psychologically vulnerable and less likely to seek the support that they need. Um, I touched on this debate, this topic in a debate on World Cancer Day, because there is research linking obesity with adverse childhood experiences, one that Parliament should explore further. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Alec Cole Hamilton, to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Mr Cole Hamilton, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to start by thanking the Scottish Government for bringing forward this motion today and indeed the consensus that they've sought to build by reaching out to opposition members in advance of it. Also welcome their efforts to maximise public response to the consultation. Whenever we have debates like this in this chamber, I'm reminded of the words of Thomas Jefferson, who said that the doctor of the future will give no medicine, but will interest his patient in the care of the human frame, in diet, and in the cause and prevention of disease. I think that he would be astonished and dismayed to learn that some 200 years later, in a developed country like Scotland, that we would see obesity and associated health conditions at their current levels. 200 years, and in many ways, our diet is worse, our engagement with physical activity poorer, and our relationship with alcohol far more extreme. Now, I don't doubt for a minute the sincerity of the Scottish Government's commitment in this regard, but this commitment has been shared by every First Minister, Health Secretary, and their opposition counterparts since devolution began. And we uh, have deployed um, 
but this commitment, so it's, it isn't working. Something's not working. We've deployed a significant body of scientific evidence, innumerable publicity campaigns, and a hope that the industry will respond and reformulate. But our collective response to this human cost of this and the, the reality that obesity is the second biggest cause of cancer after smoking has been found wanting. Our nation's waistline has still proven utterly immovable. So I have been struck that almost, as we've heard in this debate, that still two-thirds, 65% of adults in Scotland are obese, uh, overweight or obese, a figure largely unchanged since 2008. That one-third of children are overweight is a national scandal, and that correlates to the fact that children in Scotland living in two most deprived quintiles are least likely to have a healthy weight, delineating the link between social deprivation and obesity, which we've also heard something of in this afternoon's debate. And I saw that firsthand in a detached youth work shift in Govan in 2012, when I was astonished to learn that actually there were no shops selling fresh fruit or vegetables within walking distance. But it's not just diet, it's alcohol as well. And we've heard a lot again about this today. Uh, this, whilst this is disproportionately a symptom and uh, relates to poverty and deprivation in our society, it's not exclusively so. And I uh, was quite interested to hear, as I'm sure other colleagues in the Health Committee uh, were this morning, that the Chief Medical Officer, Catherine Calderwood, revealed that actually highest rates of childhood obesity actually are to be found in NH NHS Shetland and in Dumfries and Galloway. So we have to be bold and comprehensive and look at a whole system, whole country response to this. And the chair of the BMA in Scotland, Dr. Peter Benny, is quite right to state that the government has got some really good proposals here, but that we still need to go further. And he reaffirmed his view in his response that voluntary measures have failed and a heavier hand might be needed, which for me as a liberal is actually quite um, instinctively uncomfortable, but I think in this case is absolutely right. So we support things like further restrictions on sales and price promotions, uh, on sponsorship and marketing, particularly, particularly when it's directed at children. We want to see requirements to provide calorific information and food purchased in shops and restaurants and the provision, as the BMA called for, of readily accessible specialist multidisciplinary weight management units. So I welcome the motion today, I really do, uh, but it is only part of the battle, and that's where my amendment, had it been accepted, was coming from. And I think that's why, because healthy diet is only part of that answer to Thomas Jefferson's challenge. The care of the human frame, as he des described it, relies very much on the pursuance of physical activity. And we're all very conversant in this place about the many barriers to why people can't use leisure facilities locally or they don't have them nearby. But it's actually, uh, th there is another lens through which to look at that. And I think that I was very struck in our sport for everyone inquiry in the health committee that that came to the fore, that social isolation, poor self-esteem linked to mental health issues and infirmity can all contribute to poor levels of activity. Um, basic anxiety is also one of the principal um, barriers to strenuous activity. Embarrassment gets in the way, but so too can it be manifest in other forms of, uh, uh, as well. And I go on about this quite a lot, but with good reason, that fear of falling has a severely limiting effect on social orbit. If you don't have confidence in the integrity of pavements and paths around you, uh, you won't necessarily have as much physical activity at your disposal as you would otherwise. That 200 years after T Thomas Jefferson first issued his prophecy, we have in this country at least stalled in our efforts to realise it. The cost of that increase is measured out in strain on our NHS and in life outcomes for people suffering from obesity. So I thank the government for the motion today and assure them of our support for it tonight. Thank you. Thank you. I call Fulton McGregor to be followed by Maurice Corey. Mr McGregor, please. Thank you, President Officer, and I uh, remind the Chamber that I'm the PLO to the Health Minister. And I welcome the Scottish Government's ambitious new healthy weight strategy and feel that it is a good foundation for tackling Scotland's obesity problem. As others have said, healthy weight adults are now in the minority in Scotland and almost a third of our children are in danger of being overweight or obese. These figures are alarming and without proper action, our population will undoubtedly see an increase in health problems. As Obesity Action Scotland points out, we actually live in an obesogenic environment that promotes weight gain. But I must also say, uh, picking up from Annie Wells' point earlier, I must uh, state that I support body positivity, especially in our young people. However, there is a clear link between obesity and health issues such as type, type 2 diabetes, cancer and other chronic conditions. That is why we must ensure that we have early intervention and children have a healthy and positive relationship with diet and exercise from a young age so that making informed 
and healthy choices is second nature to them. The new strategy empowers personal change and I also believe there needs to be a cultural change that the strategy contributes towards. We need to tackle the link between poverty and obesity. Child poverty is a massive issue facing my constituency and Scotland more generally. In my area of Cope Bridge in Christen, an old industrial heartland recovering from deindustrialisation and chronic unemployment from the 1980s hit with the second whammy of UK austerity. So while I welcome the very pleasant uh, Mr Miles Briggs and his support for this strategy and in indeed his amendment today, I strongly believe that politically speaking, that for those of us of a progressive nature, we must always be aware of the context of Tory policy when we are implementing um, actions at a local level and elsewhere. And there is clear evidence that health eating and steering clear of processed foods is difficult when you're on a tighter budget. It's great to see that the strategy takes this into account and will be supporting families and low incomes to help them make more informed choices about calories, sugar, salt and fat. And on the issue of fat specifically, talked about less uh, than sugar perhaps, I think we need to get this right and I would like some of the strategy to focus on making the public more aware of what types of fats there are. I don't obviously have time to go into it here, but there is some strong and compelling evidence that we got it wrong to lump all fats together many years ago. Some including nuts, avocados and oils may indeed bring significant health benefits and benefits to weight. And I would encourage anyone here to watch the BBC documentary Fats vs Carbs, which I checked. I think you can still get on the, the iPlayer. It's very, very interesting indeed. I'd like to praise uh, North Lanarkshire Council for recently implementing a 365-day free school meal policy. This is something that the SNP group there uh, supported for a long time indeed, even when, when I was a councillor uh, and fought for. But credit where it's due and that the Labour Party uh, now bringing it forward for implementation. And, and there's actually to be a pilot in Coat Bridge. Uh, and I agree with the British Psychological Society that Coat Bridge and uh, that, sorry, that children and families don't just need information, but they need practical skills based education in order to increase the likelihood of the information being translated into action. And this could include more concrete skills, training focus on providing all school leavers with the ability to cook basic balanced meals. A wee bit of personal experience with this too. Just last week we had our health visit appointment for our youngest boy, just uh, eight months. And I was actually very impressed that the health visitor uh, took the time to talk about sugar content and various foods and where it can be hidden. Um, I, and at the end of the visit, I actually uh, told her that uh, I was the local MSP and that I would be bringing it up in the, the debate this week if I got the opportunity. So I think she was quite happy with that. Um, but I think it is important to uh, praise the NHS Lanarkshire staff and I'm sure others uh, that they are actually promoting this um, already. Um, another local example I'd like to give my praise to is North Lanarkshire's Community Learning and Development uh, Coat Bridge locality team who have been running a, 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 waning, a waning workshop for around five years in partnership with the Health Board, Midwives and Health Visitors. They run a four-week course which offers parents knowledge regarding diet and nutrition for their baby and family. And it includes a practical cookery lesson. And I spoke to actually a number of participants uh, of this workshop who commended the, the knowledge they gained regarding sugars, hidden sugars, fats and food labelling, especially when out shopping in supermarkets. And I think a lot were quite surprised. Um, touching on uh, physical activity, uh, presiding officer, I think it, it, we need to get this right from a, from a young age. I do welcome the, the, the Scottish Government's approach to building an active nation, uh, making our towns safer places to walk and cycle, um, strategies like the National Place Strategy, the Daily Mail Project, and a uh, commitment to, to outdoor learning. Um, just yesterday, my, my older boy came home with a, a, a note from nursery that he'll be a partic participating in the Forestry Commission's Forest Kindergarten, um, where they state that it offers children the unique opportunity to play and learn outdoors helping them connect with their natural heritage. And that seems like a really good place to end, President Officer. Thank you. Excellent place to end. Thank you very much. I call Maurice Corrie to be followed by Emma Harper, please. Mr Corrie. <coughs> Thank you, Deputy Signing Officer. I welcome the opportunity to contribute today towards today's debate. It is important that we get the, re the response to the issue to this country's health right. <coughs> the statistics, I believe, do show the full scale and breadth of the issues that we face in Scotland and are worth emphasising again. Scotland has the lowest life expectancy in Western Europe and it's been that way for more than 30 years. The Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health have found that the health of education uh, of children and education in Scotland is amongst the worst in Europe. 
Having lived with my wife and children in Croatia when I was posted there with my job, we learned to live a healthy life based on healthy foods, tennis, swimming, and great sunshine. When returning to Scotland, we had to adapt to little sunshine, freezing seas, but we kept up with the fresh foods, the olive oil, and exercise, which has stood as well so far. Nevertheless, obesity is a problem that looks set to continue over generations as well. A recent report compiled by the health experts showed that millennials are on track on track to be the most overweight generation since records began. <clears throat> the real world impact that these statistics have on individuals is immense. A poor diet has been associated with 13 types of cancer. It has also been linked with a higher risk of type 2 diabetes and a large range of cardiovascular conditions that can shorten life expectancy. The cost it has on society cannot be discounted either. This is an issue which I believe the public expect us to resolve. A poll conducted on behalf of Cancer Research UK showed that 83% of the public think Scotland has a promise with obesity. I think it is clear that the current state of our nation's health is one of the greatest challenges that is facing Scotland at the moment. I want to take a moment to note the work of my colleague, Brian Whittle, uh, in this area. I think his work is produ in producing and releasing the Scottish Conservatives' Healthy Lifestyle Strategy in 2016 is excellent. It's a great document with input and insight from a number of well-respected sources. It does as he had hoped it would do in setting out a long-term alternative strategy for health, well-being, and sport. In particular, it looks as if at the connection between having an active lifestyle, making healthy choices, and the barriers to inclusion and participation which lead to increasing health inequality and attribute towards a widening attainment gap. I would recommend reading it if you haven't already done so. Uh, I think it is also important to highlight again that it is not a problem that we can fix alone through the legislative process or by regulating what people can or cannot eat. It, I think it is most important that we, we will be ensuring that the Scottish Government focus on educating the public and providing information required to make healthy choices without removing an element of choice from people. Removing the element of choice completely from the individuals would, in my opinion, inhibit and discourage the real cultural nationwide changes we need to see. But nevertheless, I welcome the introduction of domestic science into our schools in Scotland, which is a good step forward and has taught my son to cook healthy food now. I now want to take a moment to speak about the soft drinks industry, and it's an industry I know very well indeed. Yes. Minister. It's just a, a point around the removing choice. It's just more to kind of make the point that actually some of the evidence suggests that because of higher prevalence rates of promotion, uh, food being purchased on promotion, suggests that actually we're not having an, a, a level playing field and our choice isn't as straightforward as I think the member uh, has articulated. Mr. Corey. Yes, I, right. I, and I, I look at the, so the bog off or, or offers, in fact, for example, buy one, get, uh, buy, buy one and get one free, was one of the issues that I know is being addressed by the retail industry, particularly the Grocers Federation at the moment. Uh, and that's something I know in the soft drinks industry has been looked at very, very clearly. But uh, it's a fair point, uh, Minister. Um, and I want to make a, point, make a moment to, to speak about the uh, soft drinks. It's an industry I know very well indeed from my past, and the Scottish Health Survey data show that 35% of children drink non-diet soft drinks at least once a day. Scientific Advisory Committee on Nutrition recommended that in 2015 that soft drinks consumption should be minimised. And in the 1960s, believe it or not, there were 54 soft drinks manufacturers in Scotland. Now there are only three. So hardly surprising that we know ourselves as having a sweet tooth. In Scotland, we consume three times the, amount, the recommended amount of sugar. An average of adults' daily limit should be 30 grams. A typical can of cola has about 33 grams in it, and it meaning that by drinking just one can, you exceed your average daily limit with one beverage. Now, I won't tell you that one should never drink a can of Iron Brew or Coca-Cola, but as with everything else, it should be done in moderation. And to this end, to be fair, uh, I could do add that soft drinks manufacturers have sought very hard to promote responsible consumption uh, over the past few years. But we do love our soft drinks here in Scotland, nevertheless. That's why I'm supportive of the UK government's soft drinks uh, industry level, and I'd like to see Scotland's share of the levy being spent to tackle childhood obesity, as I think this would have the longest and largest long-term effect uh, in tandem with educating the consumer. Presiding officer, in conclusion, tackling our nation's issues with health won't be easy, and it, I doubt it will be solved uh, and resolved in a single generation, but it's a fight we need to have. This issue is not one that we can be kicking into the long grass, but we have to tackle it now Take it head on, and we have to win. Thank you. I call Emma Harper to be followed by Alec Rowley. Ms Harper, please. Thank you, President Officer. I am pleased to speak in today's debate. As the motion highlights, the food environment in which people live is one of the biggest challenges facing us. Many healthy choices 
are difficult when food high in fat, salt, sugar is cheap and it's widely available and heavily promoted. Colleagues have spoken about a range of issues, diabetes, heart disease, body image and diet. And Joanne Lamott has mentioned the eating disorders debate tomorrow, which I'm participating in and actually sponsoring the post-debate event tomorrow in Parliament. And I would encourage members to come and attend. As a member of the Health and Sport Committee, I'm delighted that the Scottish Government's forthcoming strategy, backed by a £42 million investment over five years, will include world-leading proposals to restrict the promotion of junk foods, as well as providing targeted services for those with or at risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Back in November 2017, the Cross-Party Group on Diabetes, which I co-convene with Dave Stewart, MSP, we heard from filmmaker Anthony Whittington, who introduced us to his documentary focused on the topic of type 2 diabetes called Fixing Dad. Fixing Dad started as a documentary aired on the BBC about Anthony's father, Jeff. And in November 2013, Jeff's doctor suggested a foot amputation might be necessary in the near future due to his type 2 diabetes and obesity. The arch of one foot had already collapsed as a result of Charcot's foot, which is a complication associated with diabetes, and his other foot was developing ulcers due to poor circulation, another type 2 complication. So Jeff's sons, Anthony and Ian, embarked on a mission to overhaul their dad's lifestyle and prevent the premature death forecast by his doctors. Over the course of the year's filming, we see Jeff's transformation from an obese nighttime security guard to endurance cyclist and health activist. Presiding officer, Jeff lost seven stones in weight, almost 100 pounds, and he no longer requires any of his diabetes medications. Following the success of Fixing Dad, the brothers are now making new episodes using the same format and have a, they've had a big response from across the UK. I spoke with Anthony and his father Jeff at the Cross Party Group and have been in contact with him since and I'm impressed by the plans and passion to affect real societal change. The film's message is that real change may not be easy but it is achievable. Changing the habits of a lifetime isn't easy, so it is important that the right support is in place and the Scottish Government's ambitious new strategy will empower everyone to make the right personal choices for themselves. The prescription for Jeff by his two sons and the evidence of sustained weight loss, I, it took a year, it indicates that a model of social prescribing can work. Social prescribing is defined as a means of enabling primary care services to refer patients with social, emotional or practical needs to a range of... Absolutely, sure. Jamie Green, please. I, I do thank Emma Harper for taking the intervention. Uh, it's an issue that's close very dear to my heart. My mother has type 2 diabetes and one of the problems that she faces is just understanding the sheer complexity of the different amount of diets that are out there that are offered to claim to, to cure it. And uh, Do you have any views on... Uh, how we could standardise some of the advice that's actually given to people with type 2 diabetes in terms of what the best diet could be for them. I don't know if that's a diagnosis you're supposed to give now, Ms <laughs> Harper. <laughs> I thank Jamie Green for that intervention. I am not a dietitian, I'm not a diet expert, but I would recommend that anyone that is having difficulty with dietary advice seek the specialist information from a dietetic specialist in diabetes management. I continue with the social prescribing and how it's defined and I see the evidence of the benefits of social prescribing in Dumfries where constituents Scott Manson and Carly Scrambler who are both veterans of the armed forces and are qualified in exercise referral they've established their own gym called Rebuild. Scott and Carly's aim is to provide exercise recovery and rehabilitation as part of social prescribing in their Rebuild Body and Mind gym. I support their goals and I have encouraged constituents to engage with Scott and Carly so that their knowledge can be shared and their skills can help to improve the health and well-being of many people who have said they don't feel comfortable for whatever reason going to a gym. I'd like to encourage the Scottish Government while examining the current draft strategy that might be strengthened in some way to look at part of the fresh action and the need to evidence how social prescribing is actually helping improve the lives of people in Scotland. Thank you very much. I call Alec Rowley.
to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. And Mr Stevenson will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Rowley. Thank you, President Officer. As someone who's always trying to watch what I'm eating to lose some weight, I do know how difficult it can be, how difficult it can be to know what to buy, what to eat, and indeed what is good for you. And therefore, despite the efforts of successive administrations, uh, we still have issues in terms of the level of information that is available to people. We have, for this debate today, received some excellent, informative and very concerning briefs from many experts and organisations. The Cancer Research UK have said that obesity is the single biggest preventable cause of cancer after smoking and is linked to 13 types of cancer. Diabetes Scotland tell us that people in Scotland need to understand the risks of being overweight as they point out that prevalence of diabetes has increased by 40% over the last 10 years. So I take the point that Joanne Lamont makes, but I would also say that I think there is a need for us to be more informative with the public. I was certainly taken aback by some of the information that has come forward over these last few days. Obesity Action Scotland say that obesity rates in Scotland are amongst the highest in the world. I would say, presiding officer, from the levels of information in these briefs, this debate today is one of the most important that we have had off late in terms of the future health and well-being of the Scottish population. Indeed, Cancer Research UK say the Scottish Government's diet and obesity strategy presents a once-in-a-generation chance to scale down cancer in Scotland. I therefore want to focus on what might be necessary to ensure that that final strategy is not just wishful thinking, but an action plan for doing something to address these issues. In terms of action, there seems to be a consensus across most professionals and organisations that we need action and regulation to tackle price promotions of unhealthy food across the retail sector. Cancer Research say that Food Standards Scotland identified that nearly 40% of all calories, 40% of total sugar and 42% of fats and saturated fats were purchased on price promotions in 2014-15. Consumer spending on price promotions in the UK is the highest in Europe, double that of Germany, France and Spain. As the Minister knows, times are hard out there for many individuals and many families, and it is easy to see why people would be attracted to price promotions, and therefore it would be easy to see why this is absolutely an area that the Government must take action on. Fulton Mackay also made the point about the levels of poverty, the grown levels of poverty that are, that are accruing in Scotland. Much of that is not happening by accident. Much of that is happening as a direct result of UK government policy. And we need to, again, not just have warm words from members of the Tory party in this chamber. We need action to stop the attacks on the poorest and most vulnerable in our communities. The government must all also do more to curb the number of fast food outlets. It's not a coincidence that there are more and more of these in areas where there are schools and indeed areas where there is long-term disadvantage and poverty. Overprovision is a material consideration of a licensing committee, for example, where a liquor license has been applied for. We have the chance in the planning bill that's currently making its way through this parliament to look at overprovision of fast food shops, and that's one area that we should look at. But in the time that I have left, I would want to focus on, and I have spoke to the Minister before, about Fife and some of the, the projects that have been run between the Sport and Leisure Trust in Fife and Fife Council. Social prescribing, as Emma Harper mentioned earlier, there are some really good projects out there, I'm sure, right across Scotland. Those projects are struggling for funding as there is pressure on local government budgets. 
Therefore, if we're serious about tackling this, we need to ensure that exercise is part of that. Social prescribing is an excellent way forward. There are brilliant projects, as I say, but they need funded. Thank you. Thank you. I call Stuart Stevenson, who's the last speaker in the open debate. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. David Stewart made a, a sideways reference to my, let's call it, seniority uh, in this particular debate. And indeed, I am looking round the only member, uh, apart from perhaps someone in front of me, uh, who might remember uh, uh, rationing. Indeed, I was six years old. <laughs> The ground is gradually opening up under your feet, Mr. Stevenson. Um, when I wrote this, someone else was in the chair, of course. But anyway, the, 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 the bottom line is I was six when rationing, sugar rationing ended. So therefore, as a youngster, my palate was not used to having sweet things. And I think there's a very important point in that sort of rather amusing uh, comment I make, that how we eat in the very, very early days of our life will influence our preferences throughout our life. Um, I've survived to the point where my blood pressure is 120 over 60, my heart rate 72, and my respiration is running at about 20. And more critically, I've been sworn into this parliament on five occasions, and on each occasion I've worn the same suit. However, now for the bad news. I'm 30% heavier than I was when I got married uh, nearly 50 years ago, so it's not all oh, good news. It's merely not as bad as it might be. I'm, uh, I'm afraid of that weight uh, gain, of course. I must say probably most of it is fat rather than muscle. Uh, Brian Whittle, uh, the most uh, accomplished athlete um, in our number this afternoon, uh, would uh, no doubt agree. Of course, muscle weighs more than fat. So perhaps there's a, a, a modest uh, a, a advantage. Now, I just want to talk a little bit about the psychology of being overweight. Um, we, we, we had a comment about uh, the debate we'll have uh, tomorrow uh, on eating disorders. And of course, they come both to cause people to be underweight and to cause people uh, to be overweight. And being in possession of an eating disorder uh, is linked to stress. It's linked to low self-esteem. It might even be linked uh, to some degree of um, mental ill health. Some of the language used does not help. And we've used the word junk food quite frequently in this debate. And I think when we suggest to people that they are eating junk food, we demean them, we disincentivize, we make them feel bad about themselves because the word junk isn't a nice word. I don't think it's the kind of word uh, that we should uh, use too much. Uh, we've heard a little bit about labelling uh, from Ash Denham, for example. I think uh, we need very vigorous rules. It's sometimes really quite difficult. I pick things up, now look how many calories, and then in tiny, tiny print it says that's for half the content of this packet, and it is in tiny print. Or in some cases even, it's a fifth of the packet. I want to see in 20-point print on the front of everything that's prepackaged how many calories are in the packet. Then I can start to do meaningful uh, estimation uh, of, of, of what's going on. Um, now, uh, I think, too, that we talked about the outdoors and uh, exercise. It's also worth saying that uh, we can extend the eating habits of the young by just walking around. There's hedgerow food. Uh, we normally pick enough brambles that will do it for most of the year. They go in the freezer. Uh, there's been a huge crop of wild raspberries in our area. There's mushrooms out there. Uh, when I want something sweet when I'm in the country, I pick up a clover flower and just stick it in my mouth and suck it. And isn't that just lovely? There's seaweed not far away, tree resin. And nettles are an excellent thing to add to things like mince and stews and so on and so forth. Um, that, that, of course, when they're cooked, have no adverse effect whatsoever uh, on one's palate. We've talked a bit about salt. Salt is, of course, sodium chloride. Well, of course, it's possible to buy formulations of salt uh, that have potassium chloride, which are much less harmful to uh, the metabolism while giving exactly the same uh, fla flavor benefits. Now, we've had a little bit about uh, alcohol. I must confess to you here and now, 
I, I reckon alcohol is probably something that is equivalent to a meal a week for me. And for a lot of us, it might be something similar. Think of it in those terms and you think of the benefits. In my lifetime, presiding officer, and I think this goes to the heart of it, we started at the beginning of my life eating to live. Now, alas, too many of us are living to eat. Um, entertaining as usual, uh, Mr. Stevenson, as well as informative. Uh, I call on Anna Sarwar to close for Labour. Six minutes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, how do you follow that, Deputy Presiding Officer? Uh, can, can I say it's, it's been a, a really good debate that we've had today, and it's, uh, it's good that there's been so much uh, consensus, because this is a hugely important debate. Uh, this Parliament has previously put on, as a priority uh, our tackling of, of smoking and tobacco, uh, our alcohol strategy, and I do generally believe that the next big public health challenge is around tackling obesity and all the related health issues that follow from it. Um, as others have said, the health implications from obesity are truly horrifying. Um, Alec Cole Hamilton quoted some of the statistics, and I want to repeat them. Um, obesity is the single biggest preventative cause of cancer after smoking and is linked to 13 different types of cancer. It represents almost 85% of the overall risk factor of developing type 2 diabetes. It's a significant cause of ill health and premature mortality. And these implications are put into real perspective when you consider that Scotland's level of overweight and obesity are the worst in the UK and amongst the worst in the OECD countries. 65% of adults and 29% of children in Scotland are overweight or obese. Um, as the Minister said in the opening, there is wide uh, consensus uh, on this issue. And she did mention the um, letter that was signed by all cross-party health spokespeople. I think that is a consensus that can be built on so we can have an ambitious strategy that leads by example, uh, not just for the rest of the UK, but indeed um, globally. Uh, Miles Briggs put on record his thanks to all the organisations. I want to repeat that thanks to all the organisations and stakeholders who have helped provide briefings on this, but also have been regular campaigners on this issue. And I want to pay particular tribute to Cancer Research UK, uh, who have been doing a fantastic public health awareness campaign as well as lobbying heavily uh, their parliamentarians. Uh, Dave Stewart and Alison Johnson mentioned the link between not just diet and health outcomes, but actually inequality and poverty, and their links to diet and then health outcomes. I think that needs to be looked at in the round when we come up with this obesity strategy, because it does impact on life expectancy, because it does impact on life chances, and it does impact on life outcomes too. Um, so there is a human interest in terms of tackling obesity and the challenges that come from it. There's also a financial interest. Uh, we see the increasing pressures on our National Health Service, the increasing uh, pressure in terms of capacity, but also the increasing financial pressures. Uh, and the cost uh, of obesity and the outcomes of obesity are obviously a huge issue for our National Health Service too. Um, Sandra White and others mentioned local community projects. I think Kenneth Gibson also mentioned some, mentioned some local community projects. I think we should put on thank, record our thanks, not just to our NHS, not also to our third sector organisations, but actually to the community organisations who are doing so much important work for local um, interventions, particularly in those uh, hardest to reach areas for the efforts that they do. And I'll come back and touch upon uh, later about the impact of, of local budgets uh, and local government uh, in terms of doing that. Uh, active Life was mentioned by Annie Wells and others. I think that's an important part. I don't think we can look at diet in isolation. I think we have to look at active participation, whether that be sports participation, uh, or indeed active uh, travel uh, and ensuring that active travel is also safe so people can have that as alternative forms of travel uh, that help protect the environment but also help to promote uh, good health. Uh, I thought Joanne Lamont made a very, very uh, important point around uh, body shaming uh, and bullying and the pressures that come with popular culture. I think that is a hugely significant issue that goes beyond just putting uh, restrictions on what people uh, can eat or what they can access actually what resources are available in terms of how we educate young people, how we give pe young people confidence uh, in their own appearance, confidence uh, in what they can achieve and not shaming individuals into uh, action. I think that would have a negative approach. I think we have to uh, try and encourage uh, better behaviour and changing culture through working with communities rather than making it look like we're victimising uh, individual communities or indeed individuals themselves. Uh, Morris Corey mentioned the sugar tax and talked in length about sugar. I've got to say um, all his um, anger towards sugar and the impact of it made the dentist in me very, very happy. Um, so um, more action on sugar is, of course, um, welcome. 
Now, there's been a number of uh, issues in terms of the individual strategy I think are important. I think we need to look at advertising and the impact that advertising has on shaping the, the mindset of, of young people, the timing of those adverts. I know the minister mentioned that before. I think we need to look at portion sizes and the impact uh, that has. Uh, affordability, uh, I think there is at least a perception that healthy food is uh, more expensive and less affordable than unhealthy food. I think we need to work closely with uh, retailers to make sure that affordable food is healthy and also we encourage people to buy that healthy food when it is uh, more affordable. I think we need to take action on, on multi-buys. It's been mentioned before that 40% of the sugar intake, 40% of the saturated fat intake, 40% of the calorie intake is from multi-buy schemes. How we clamp down on multi-buys I think is important. How we encourage better labelling and also how we use our planning uh, and licensing to make sure we have uh, appropriate uh, distance between schools uh, and people that want to sell uh, unhealthy foods. Uh, I want to just touch upon, in, in closing, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, around uh, local government funding. I think we can't look at active participation, active travel in isolation away from local government finance. There is a direct link between budgets of local authorities and their ability to invest in their local communities and in quality local facilities that can be affordable, safe and accessible for people from all backgrounds. Um, and just in closing, this is an issue that has broad cross-party support. It's one I want us to be ambitious on and I will look forward to working closely with the government to deliver an obesity strategy that can be historic but also make real changes to people's lifestyles. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call on Brian Whittle to close. We can serve to seven minutes, please, Mr Whittle. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I can assure Mr Stevenson that muscle is heavy on fat. But that makes no difference to me these days. I remember the day and now it's night. Um, it, it's been an interesting and consensual debate today which highlights the cross-party recognition that this is a serious issue that needs us all to park any political acts we may, may wish to grind. And I also wanted to add here, it's not just about maintaining a healthy weight, it's also about eating a healthy diet to tackle modern day malnutrition because it's entirely possible to be overweight and be malnourished, a fact that is a growing problem, not just here in Scotland, but in the wider developed countries. And listening to today's debate and reading through the government's motion, I think there is a danger that the issue of the healthy weight strategy will be considered in isolation. And that, by that I mean discussing measures to tackle it as an individual health condition and within only one portfolio, as, as, as Miles Briggs alluded to. And I agree with Kenny Gibson that, 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 uh, that our relationship with food, drink and physical activity must be taken over a lifetime, and, and, and that's how we should frame this debate. And when we decide what steps we take, and the rhetoric we use, as Stuart Stevenson said, it is absolutely paramount that we do not stigmatise any condition or person, which I think Joanne Lamont articulated so well in discussing uh, eating disorders. I think successfully tackling obesity, smoking, and a poor relationship with alcohol, they have a real connection to poor mental health in many cases, as Annie Wells took the time in what I thought was quite a thoughtful speech to bring that very point to the chamber. And that will in turn help to tackle other rising incidents of preventable conditions such as type 2 diabetes, which has been mentioned many times in the chamber today, as well as musculoskeletal conditions, many cancers, chest, heart and stroke conditions. See, the two key pillars to a healthy lifestyle are physical activity and nutrition. And there is a symbiotic relationship between, uh, between these two behaviours in that one drives, one, one drives the other's behaviour. To consider one without the other, I think, would have a limited scope for success. When it comes to the nutrition in Scotland, we, we have food producers that are recognised for producing some of the highest quality food in the world. Yet we, we remain the unhealthiest country in Europe and the unhealthiest small country in the world. And this would suggest that locally grown produce is not getting to the Scottish tables as it should be. Now our farmers produce the highest quality food, are charged with custodianship of the countryside and are paying the living wage and ensure the highest of animal welfare standards. Yet when it comes to public procurement, we find a high proportion of our food for schools and hospitals, much of which can be sourced locally, comes from cheaper imports. And I would, I would hold up East Ayrshire Council here as showing the way and I'd like other councils to follow. Now, I mentioned earlier the link between poor nutrition and the lack of physical activity as contributory factors in poor mental health. And good mental health is the starting point for tackling issues such as maintaining or achieving a healthy weight. So while it's all good and well for, for, for us politicians to consider delivering advice on healthy eating, looking at taxing unhealthy food or banning multi-buys for unhealthy product, this will only be relevant if the very people we are trying to reach are, in, are not in the mind, are in a mindset that will be able to accept and act on that device, on that advice. And, and, and the Mental Health Foundation's presentation 
food for thought, they were stating that one of the most obvious yet under-recognized factors in the development of mental health is nutrition. Then there is a growing body of evidence indicating that nutrition must play an important role in the prevention, development and management of diagnosed mental health problems, including depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, ADHD and dementia. Sam H is Scotland's mental health charter for physical activity. Uh, su suggests that physical activity through sport or recreation has been proven to have a positive impact on physical and mental health and well-being. Research suggesting that less physical activity a person does, the more likely they are to experience low mood depression, attention and worry. Um, uh, uh, education, of all, uh, as, as has been highlighted today, quite a few people must play a pivotal role in tackling long-term health issues. As Sam H suggests, there is a lot of people who would like to be active but don't know how to. And I've often said in this place that I believe that education is a major solution to health and welfare. Now, uh, one of the things we haven't discussed in here is, is a delivery of a mechanism of any strategy that we might bring forward. And without this, any consultation may join others that are gathering the dust on the shelf. And I think the third sector here are key deliverers. And I would like to use three very different examples in, in managing the same outcome. The Cardiac Physi Physiotherapy Department at Crosshouse Hospital and NHS Ayrshire and Arran have been running an extended community rehabilitation programme that not only helps chest, heart and stroke sufferers, but also welcomes other people with conditions such as obesity and musculoskeletal sufferers. The comorbidity exercise and education classes have been very successful in not only reducing further readmissions to hospital or doctor's appointments, they have been very instrumental in increasing the quality of life from those suffering from those conditions. And last night I, I revisited Dune Valley Boxing Club to, to just to, to watch Sam Mullen, who has made such a massive impact in the community in Dunmellington. Having brought the community in there, he's developed a boxing club and a gym. And he's trained trainers. He now has the parents who bring their kids to the boxing club who take part in the boxing, while the, the parents take part in the gym and then pick their kids up and go home. And lastly, I wanted to mention Centre Stage and Catalyst. I know quite a few people in here are aware of them, and they use music and art to draw people into to, to the community, and it speaks very much to mental health and, and to, to the how, uh, how they deal with food. And the key word to all of the above is community. All of the above happen locally in the community where there's a hook that brings people in to engage people and enable other conversations. So it's not just about the money in your pocket, it's about <coughs> how much things cost, it's about access to opportunity in those communities where they have maybe little amenities and little, perhaps, resource to travel, which speaks very much to, to, to Dave Stewart's point in the Labour Amendment and why we will be supporting that as well. Sandra uh, White and Emma, uh, Emma Harper mentioned social prescribing uh, to the third sector, but our doctors, nurses, midwives, physios, health visitors, our teachers, our nursery workers and all must there, therefore be the very first step in this strategy. And who is looking after our healthcare professionals and teachers? They need the tools in the room to breathe to allow them to have the active, healthy lifestyle they are encouraging others to adopt. And one of the things I think we have to consider is the tension between a child's right to be protected from health-harming products and their freedom to choose. And we have some very difficult decisions to make here. I mean, what is the point of restricting junk food promotions if, if, if school children can leave the school at lunchtime and buy junk food from a van parked outside the school? If the law does not allow the banning of these enterprises, then change the law. And I see them. Am I get seven minutes, uh, Presiding Officer? Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, I will go to the end then. So I think there's some very, very big decisions to be made here. And even if they're unpopular to start with, you'll find you have support across the chamber, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr. Whittle. I call on Minister Eileen Campbell to wind up the debate. Thank you, Presiding uh, Officer. Dave Stewart described the challenges Scotland faces in terms of uh, our diet is feeling like a guardian knot. And when we consider the statistics, the culture, societal and marketing changes that we need to ensure success, I think we would all be forgiven for feeling this issue is impossible. But what I've taken from this debate is again an, an underline under the understanding that there is a need to take action and a consensus uh, and that our poor health need not simply be inevitable. But 
this agreement is not just a consensus where we all each pat one another on the back and congratulate us all on having great ideas, but today's debate, I think, has been fundamentally, and the contributions that I've heard today have been constructive, they've been informed, they've been reflective, and where they've needed to be, they have also been challenging of government. And that is absolutely correct, because if I ultimately, the minister responsible for this policy, want to have the consensus and backing of this parliament, and if we all agree that a step change and a culture change is needed, then we need this space uh, to contribute, uh, to collectively feel ownership on Scotland's eventual uh, diet and obesity strategy approach. Now, food is one of life's great pleasures, and as others have reflected on their own experience, my own one was growing up on a farm, and from that I got a sense of seasonality, uh, how food has grown, its connection to the land. I was incredibly lucky. And as Kenny Gibson noted, it is really regrettable that our global reputation as a country of fantastic produce, renowned the world over, is at odds and a complete paradox to our obesity levels and our current relationship with food. It is also at odds with the stark reality of people's lives who rely on food banks and the inequalities that drive Scotland's public health challenges. So I sincerely agree with the comments made by colleagues that we cannot look at this issue purely through uh, a siloed health lens. This issue is relevant to all my colleagues right across uh, uh, government, in transport, in planning, in social security, in equalities, education, uh, and undoubtedly a whole lot more. Because obesity is costly to our NHS, it's impacting on its sustainability, it is costly to our economy, and as all members recognised, it is also costly in terms of our health and well-being, uh, and especially those who are most disadvantaged. The facts that many uh, members spoke to uh, this uh, afternoon uh, are stark. 65% of adults are overweight, 29% are obese, 29% of children are at risk of becoming overweight. 87% of type 2, uh, those with type 2 diabetes are overweight or obese. Sugar consumption in children and adults is above recommended levels. In 2016, 20%, only 20% of adults met the five a day recommendation. Going back again to that point that Kenny Gibson made about us not being a, a country known for our produce and yet 20% of adults only managing to have five, uh, that recommended five a day. 50% of sugar that we consume comes from discretionary products. And food uh, high in fat and sugar and salt uh, is more likely to be purchased on promotion. A stark list of statistics illustrating the clear need for action. But I think it's important to recognise that we're not starting from scratch. There are uh, some encouraging signs of progress. The percentage of inactive children has decreased from 10% in 2015 to 8% in 2016. The percentage of children meeting guidelines on physical activity has increased. Walking participation has helped encourage a slight upward trend in general activity levels in the country. And 2,000 convenience stores in the Scottish Government Healthy Living Programme, most of them in most, our most deprived areas, are providing local access to fruit and veg, a point that was raised, I think, by Alec Cole Hamilton. And our healthcare retail standard is altering the environment of that offer of food and drink in our NHS. And I think that's, again, a point made by Brian Whittle, that we need to also make sure that we support our health staff as well. And the healthcare retail standard is an important point in which we are allowing them to choose healthier options. And of course, as well as I mentioned in my opening remarks, breastfeeding rates have shown an encouraging upward trend. But while this is all positive, what is clear is a, a need for, uh, as uh, Kenny Gibson, Annie Wells, uh, Alison Johnson all said, a significant culture change. And that is why boldness, imagination and innovation is uh, required. So turning to the points that were raised by members, a big theme from today's debate was around empowerment and community-led initiatives and also social prescribing, all raised by Annie Wells, Sandra White, uh, Alec Rowley, uh, Alec Cole Hamilton uh, and Emma Harper. And that is absolutely a key theme that came through in responses that contributors recognised needed to be strengthened. And that again illustrates the need to work beyond the health world. Uh, members mentioned the uh, allotments, other community-led initiatives, social connectedness that comes from those, uh, those initiatives, that knowledge transfer and support through getting people working alongside one another in their communities. Uh, 
Alec Rowley mentioned the Fife initiatives in his constituency as well, and I know it's something he's keen on allotments and the, the act of, of growing your own food. In Edinburgh, I met with people who are getting supported through um, that knowledge transfer, that support around what to cook, how to cook it, those very basic things, but were so, re so required uh, by those people in those communities. And of course, Sandra White mentioned uh, initiatives in her uh, constituency as well. And I think there was also an important point, although some did laugh at Stuart Stevenson, some of Stuart Stevenson's comments, but I think the important point was around the seasonality of food as well, the ability to go out and uh, uh, find your own, forage for your own. But there is an important point here around that lack of connection that we have as a country with land, our land and with our food production. And I think his comments were the antithesis to what Ash Denham mentioned around the, the, uh, the increase in the accessibility of processed foods. Annie Wells, Alec Hamilton, Alison Johnson also raised correctly psychological issues associated with food, the body images, the stresses of modern living, this distorted perspective of what healthy looks like, uh, and of course uh, associated eating disorders. And also importantly, a recurring theme in many debates in this parliament of late has been adverse childhood experiences, uh, those impacting on people's ability to cope, and that's reliance on food and poor choices of food in, in order to cope with those traumas of the past. So our challenge is to understand and to help and to support people and I'll certainly be working and continue to work with uh, Maureen Watt as she takes forward her mental health uh, strategy, making sure there are adequate connections across these portfolios to maximise the impact that both strategies will have when we're going forward. And that's why it's important, I think it's also important to demand more responsible marketing to include, it, and including uh, better promotions will be important to tackling that urge to buy and that bombardment of images that is so prevalent. There, that removal of the empowerment that many members said was so important around community-led initiatives also needs to be felt in the arenas that we buy our food, empowering people to make and help them make positive choices. And I think Joanne Lamont also made a really important contribution. As some of it I, I agreed with, some of it was challenging to gov government, but I think what was key to her uh, contribution was that personal testimony and what she's seen as in her professional life uh, as a teacher. And I think she was also right to urge caution in our language, the bullying, the body shaming, all of those things that can go along when we, when we have this uh, discussion around diet and obesity. She's absolutely right that we need to be bold and imaginative, but we need to temper that with uh, caution in how we articulate this uh, issue. Uh, and finally, uh, Dave Stewart also uh, made a good point around how we evaluate the work that we're taking forward and in particular and, and specifically mentioned uh, issues around the Sky Diabetes. The Sky Diabetes is the most complete and comprehensive national disease register and database of a major long-term condition in the world and it's recognised the world over and, and he's right to make that point because this is going to be a fundamental plank about how we absolutely manage to monitor and evaluate what we're doing within this strategy and to give him some comfort Scottish government officials continue to work closely with the Sky Diabetes team uh, in order to uh, look towards a long-term sustain sustainability of this very uh, valued and world-renowned system. And Brian Whittle, I think, was also uh, right to point to um, young people. We've mentioned early years, but the danger is that in talking around early intervention that we simply equate that with action only in the early years and we need to recognise that our adolescents require support uh, as well to uh, enable them to continue to make uh, and take positive choices and I think in this year of young people that gives us extra, uh, uh, an extra imperative to make sure that we get our actions right. So, presiding officer, it is clear that Scotland now has an appetite for a bold, innovative and effective strategy that draws on the evidence that we have to enable more people to have healthier, happier lives and to relieve pressure on our NHS. And these plans, it seems, and I think we all agree, need to limit the marketing of products that are high in fat, sugar or salt that will be important for our forthcoming strategy. So too, as Dave Stewart and Stuart Stevenson, Stevenson mentioned, the, the clear, clearer labelling on our food and the clarity on what we buy and eat and the information that is uh, imparted to uh, members of the public. Cancer Research UK, Obesity Action Scotland, Food Standards uh, Scotland and a whole host of others have provided an authoritative and evidence-based voice in this and they deserve our thanks as members have this afternoon because they have very much set the tone and seen to enable us as politicians to land, I hope, what will be an effective strategy that will create the healthier Scotland that we need to see. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes our debate on developing a Scottish Healthy Weight Strategy. The next item of business is a statement by Mike Russell on an update of the European Union Withdrawal Bill.
the Minister will take questions at the end of his statement, so I would encourage all members who wish to ask a question to press their request to speak buttons now.